Section 14 of The Chronicles of Newgate, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Chronicles of Newgate, Volume 1, by Arthur Griffiths. Section 14. Later Records. Returning to meaner and more commonplace offenders, I find in the records full details of all manner of crimes. Murders the most atrocious and bloodthirsty, robberies executed with great ingenuity and boldness by both sexes, remarkable instances of swindling and successful frauds, early cases of forgery, coining carried out with extensive ramifications, piracies upon the high seas, long practiced with strange immunity from reprisals. Perhaps the most revolting murder ever perpetrated, not excepting those of later date, was that in which Catherine Hayes assisted. The victim was her husband, an unoffending, industrious man, whose life she made miserable, boasting once, indeed, that she would think it no more sin to murder him than to kill a dog. After a violent quarrel between them, she persuaded a man who lodged with them, named Billings, and who was either her lover or her illegitimate son, to join her in an attempt upon Hayes. A new lodger would, arriving, it was necessary to make him a party to the plot, but he long resisted Mrs. Hayes' specious arguments, till she clenched them by declaring that Hayes was an atheist and a murderer, whom it could be no crime to kill. Moreover, that at his death she would become possessed of fifteen hundred pounds, which she would hand over to Wood. Wood at last yielded, and after some discussion it was decided to do the dreadful deed while Hayes was in his cups. After a long drinking bout in which Hayes drank wine, probably drugged, and the rest beer, the victim dragged himself to bed and fell on it in a stupor. Billings now went in and with a hatchet struck Hayes a violent blow on the head and fractured his skull. Then Wood gave the poor wretch, as he was not quite dead, two more blows and finished him. The next job was to dispose of the murdered man's remains. To evade identification, Catherine Hayes suggested that the head should be cut off which Wood effected with his pocket-knife. She then proposed to boil it, but this was overruled, and the head was disposed of by the men, who threw it into the Thames from a wharf near the horse ferry at Westminster. They hoped that the damning evidence would be carried off by the next tide, but it remained floating near shore, and was picked up next day by a watchman and handed over to the parish officers, by whom, when washed and the hair combed, it was placed on the top of a pole in the churchyard of St. Margaret's, Westminster. Having got rid of the head, the murderers next dealt with the body, which they dismembered and packed the parts into a box. This was conveyed to Marylebone, where the pieces were taken out, wrapped in an old blanket, and sunk in a pond. Meanwhile, the exposed head had been viewed by curious crowds, and at last a Mr. Bennet, an organ-builder, saw a resemblance to the face of Hayes, with whom he had been acquainted. Another person, a journeyman tailor, also recognized it, and inquiries were made of Catherine as to her husband. At first she threw people off the scent by confessing that Hayes had killed a man and absconded, but being questioned by several she told a different story to each, and presently suspicion fell upon her. As it had come out that Billings and Wood had been drinking with Hayes the last time he was seen, they were included in the warrant, which was now issued for the apprehension of the murderers. The woman was arrested by Mr. Justice Lambert in person, who had procured the assistance of two officers of the lifeguards and Billings with her. One was committed to the Bridewell, Tothill Fields, the other to the gatehouse. Catherine's conduct, when brought into the presence of her murdered husband's head, almost passes belief. Taking the glass bottle in which it had been preserved into her arms, she cried, "'It is my dear husband's head!' and shed tears as she embraced it. The surgeon, having taken the head out of the case, she kissed it rapturously and begged to be indulged with a lock of his hair. Next day, the trunk and remains of the corpse were discovered at Marylebone without the head, and the justices, nearly satisfied as to the guilt of Catherine Hayes, committed her to Newgate. Wood was soon after captured, and on hearing that the body had been found, confessed the whole crime. Billings shortly did the same, but Mrs. Hayes obstinately refused to admit her guilt. This atrocious creature was for the moment the centre of interest. Numbers visited her in Newgate and sought to learn her reasons for committing so dreadful a crime. But she gave different and evasive answers to all. At her trial she pleaded hard to be exempted from the penalty of petty treason, which was at that time burning. 
alleging that she was not guilty of striking the fatal blow. The crime of petty treason was established when any person out of malice took away the life of another to whom he or she owed special obedience, as when a servant killed his master, a wife her husband, or an ecclesiastic his superior. The wife's accomplices in the murder of a husband were not deemed guilty of petty treason. She was told the law must take its course. Billings and Wood hoped they might not be hung in chains, but received no answer. Wood actually died in prison before execution. Billings suffered at Tyburn, and was hung in chains near the pond in Marylebone. Mrs. Hayes tried to destroy herself, but failed, and was literally burnt alive. The fire reaching the hands of the hangman, he let go the rope by which she was to have been strangled, and the flames slowly consumed her, as she pushed the blazing faggots from her, and rent the air with her agonized cries. Her execution, which took place on 9th May, 1726, was not the last of its kind. In November, 1750, Amy Hutchinson was burnt at Eli, after a conviction of petty treason, having poisoned a husband newly married, whom she had taken to spite a truant lover. In 1767, again, Anne Sourley underwent the same awful sentence at York. She also had poisoned her husband. Last of all, on the 10th of March, 1788, a woman was burnt before the debtor's door of Newgate. Having been tied to a stake and seated on a stool, the stool was withdrawn and she was strangled. After that, she was burnt. Her offense was coining. In the following year, 1789, an act was passed which abolished this cruel custom of burning women for petty treason. Sarah Malcolm was another female monster, a wholesale murderess, whose case stands out as one of particular atrocity even in those bloodthirsty times. She was employed as a laundress in the temple, where she waited on several gentlemen, and had also access in her capacity of charwoman to the chambers occupied by an aged lady named Mrs. Duncombe. Footnote. As barristers often preferred to do business at their own homes, chambers in the temple were rather at a discount just then, and their landlords, preferring tenants of no legal skill to no tenants at all, let them out to any that offered. Consequently, many private people creep about the inns of the court. Newgate Calendar, 1, 470. End of footnote. Sarah's cupidity was excited by the chance sight of her mistress's hoarded wealth, both in silver plate and broad coins, and she resolved to become possessed of it, hoping, when enriched, to gain a young man of her acquaintance named Alexander as her husband. Mrs. Duncombe had two other servants, Elizabeth Harrison, also aged, and a young maid named Anne Price, who resided with her in the temple. One day, February 2, 1733, a friend coming to call upon Mrs. Duncombe was unable to gain admittance. After some delay, the rooms were broken into, and the three occupants were found barbarously murdered, the girl Price in the first room, with her throat cut from ear to ear, her hair loose, hanging over her eyes, and her hands clenched. In the next lay Elizabeth Harrison on a press bed, strangled, and last of all, old Mrs. Duncombe, also lying across her bed, quite dead. The strong box had been broken open and rifled. That same night, one of the barristers, returning to his chambers late, found Sarah Malcolm there, kindling a fire and after remarking upon her appearance at that strange hour, bade her be gone, saying that no person acquainted with Mrs. Duncombe should be in his chambers till the murderer was discovered. Before leaving, she confessed to having stolen two of his waistcoats, whereupon he called the watch and gave her into custody. After her departure, assisted by a friend, the barrister made a thorough search of his rooms, and in a cupboard came upon a lot of linen stained with blood, also a silver tankard with blood upon the handle. The watchman had suffered Sarah to go at large, but she was forthwith rearrested. On searching her, a green silk purse containing twenty-one counters was found upon her, and she was committed to Newgate. There, on arrival, she sought to hire the best accommodation, offering two or three guineas for a room upon the master debtor's side. Roger Johnston, a turnkey, upon this searched her and discovered, concealed under her hair, no doubt in a species of chignon, a bag containing twenty moidors, eighteen guineas, and a number of other broad pieces. This money, she confessed, had come from Mrs. Duncombe. But she stoutly denied all complicity with the murder, or that she had done more than contrive the robbery. She charged two brothers named Alexander, one the man she desired to marry, and a woman, Mary Tracy, with the greater crime. Upon her information they were arrested and confronted with her, 
She persisted in this line of defense at her trial, but the circumstantial evidence against her was so strong that the jury at once found her guilty. She herself had but little hope of escape, and had been heard to cry out on her first commitment, I am a dead woman. She was duly executed at Tyburn. The Alexanders and Tracy were discharged. I have specially instanced these foul murders as exhibiting circumstances of atrocity rarely equaled in the records of crime. Catherine Hayes and Sarah Malcolm were unsexed desperados, whose misdeeds throw into the shade those of the Mannings and Kate Websters of later times. But women had no monopoly of assassination, in those days when life was held so cheap. Male murderers were still more numerous, and also more pitiless and bloodthirsty. The calendars are replete with homicides, and to refer to them in anything like detail would both weary and disgust the reader. I shall do no more, therefore, than briefly indicate here a certain number of the more prominent cases, remarkable either from the position of the criminals, the ties by which they were bound to their victims, or the horrible character of the crime. The hangman figures among the murderers of this epoch. John Price, who filled the office in 1718, and who rejoiced in the usual official sobriquet of Jack Ketch, was a scoundrel rendered still more callous and cruel by his dreadful calling. He had begun life well as an apprentice, but he absconded, and entering the navy, served with credit on board different king's ships for eighteen years. On his discharge, seeking employment, he obtained the situation of public executioner. He might have lived decently on the hangman's wages and perquisites, but he was a spendthrift who soon became acquainted with the interiors of the debtors' prisons for Middlesex. Once he was arrested on his way back from Tyburn after a good day's work, having in his possession, besides fees, the complete suits of three men who had just been executed. He gave up all this to liquidate the debt, but the value being insufficient, he was lodged in the marshalsea. When released in due course, he returned to his old employment, but was soon arrested again, and on a serious charge, that of a murderous assault upon a poor woman who sold gingerbread through the streets. He had shamefully attacked her, and maddened by her resistance, had ill-used her terribly. He beat her so cruelly, the account says, that streams of blood issued from her eyes and mouth. He broke one of her arms, knocked out some of her teeth, bruised her head in a most shameful manner, and forced one of her eyes from the socket. One account says that he was taken red-handed close to the scene of his guilt. Another, the more probable, that he was arrested on his way to Tyburn with a convict for the gallows. In any case, his unfortunate victim had just life in her to bear testimony against him. Price was committed to Newgate and tried for his life. His defense was that in crossing Moorfields he found something lying in his way, which he kicked and found to be the body of a woman. He lifted her up, but she could not stand on her legs. The evidence of others was too clear, and the jury did not hesitate to convict. After sentence, he abandoned himself to drink and obstinately refused to confess but on the day before his execution he acknowledged that he had committed the crime while in a state of intoxication. He was hanged in Bunhill Fields, and his body afterwards exhibited in chains in Holloway, near the scene of the murder. Wife murder was of common occurrence in these reckless times. The disgraceful state of the marriage laws and the facility with which the matrimonial knot could be tied often tempted unscrupulous people to commit bigamy. Footnote. Beau Fielding who was tried at the Old Bailey in 1706 for committing bigamy with the Duchess of Cleveland, is one of the most remarkable instances of this. See Celebrated Trials, 3, 534. Also see the trial of the Duchess of Kingston, Remarkable Trials, 203. She was tried by the House of Lords, found guilty, but pleaded her peerage and was discharged. End footnote. Louis Hussar was of French extraction, settled in England, who married Anne Rondeau at the French church in Spitalfields. After about three years he left his wife with disgust, and going into the city, passed himself off as a single man. Becoming acquainted with a Mrs. Hearn, he presently married her. He had not been long married before his new wife taxed him with having another wife. He swore it was false and offered to take the sacrament upon it. She appeared satisfied and begged him to clear his reputation. Do not be uneasy, he said. In a little while I will make you sensible I have no other wife. He now resolved to make away with the first Mrs. Louis Hussard, otherwise Anne Rondeau, and reopened communications with her, 
Finding her in ill health, one day he brought her a medicine which had the appearance of conserve of roses, which threw her into such severe convulsive fits that her life was despaired of for some hours, but at length she recovered. This attempt having failed, he tried a simpler plan. Dressed in a white coat with a sword and cane, he went one evening to the end of Swan Alley, where his wife lived with her mother, and finding a boy, gave him a penny to go and tell Mrs. Rondeau that a gentleman wanted to speak to her in a neighboring public house. When she left the house, Oussard went in, found his wife alone, and cut her throat with a razor. Thus murdered, she was found by her mother on her return, after inquiring in vain for the gentleman who was said to be waiting for her. Suspicion fell on Oussard, who was arrested and tried, but for want of the boy's evidence, acquitted of the murder. But he was detained in Newgate to take his trial for bigamy. While waiting sentence, the boy, a lad of thirteen, who knew of the murder and arrest, and who thought he would be hanged if he confessed that he had carried the message to Mrs. Rondeau, came forward to give evidence. He was taken to Newgate into a room, and identified Oussard at once among seven or eight others. The brother of the deceased, Solomon Rondeau, as heir, now lodged an appeal, in the names of John Doe and Richard Rowe, an ancient form of legal procedure, against Oussard who was eventually again brought to trial. Various pleas were put forward by the defense in bar of further proceedings, among others that there were no such persons as John Doe and Richard Rowe. But this plea with the rest was overruled, the fact being sworn to that there was a John Doe in Middlesex, a weaver, also a Richard Rowe, who was a soldier, and the trial went on. The boy's evidence was very plain. He remembered Usar distinctly, had seen him by the light of a lantern at a butcher's shop. He wore a whitish coat. The boy also recognized Mrs. Rondeau as the woman to whom he gave the message. Others swore to the white coat which Oussard had on, but the most damning evidence was that of a friend whom he had summoned to see him in Newgate, and whom he asked to swear that they had been drinking together in Newgate Street at the time the murder was committed. Oussard offered this witness a new shirt, a new suit of clothes, and twenty guineas to swear for him. The prisoner, however, owned that he did give the boy a penny to call the woman out, and that he then went in and gave his wife a touch with the razor, but did not think of killing her. The prisoner was found guilty and hanged at the end of Swanyard in Shoreditch. Vincent Davis was another miscreant who murdered his wife under much the same conditions. He had long barbarously ill-used her. He kept a small walking-cane on purpose to beat her with, and at last so frightened her by his threats to kill her that she ran away from him. She returned one night, but finding that he had put an open knife by the bedside, she placed herself under the protection of the landlady, who advised her to swear the peace against him and get him imprisoned. Next day the brutal husband drove her out of the house, declaring she had no right to be in his company, as he was married to little Jenny. But she implored him to be friends, and having followed him to an alehouse seeking reconciliation, he so slashed her fingers with a knife that she came back with bleeding hands. That same night, when his wife met him on his return home, he ordered her to light him to his room, then, drawing his knife, stabbed her in the breast. The poor woman bled to death in half an hour. Davis, after the deed was done, was seized with contrition, and when arrested and on his way to Newgate, he told the peace officer that he had killed the best wife in the world. "'I know I shall be hanged,' he added, "'but for God's sake don't let me be anatomized.' This man is said to have assumed an air of bravado while he lay under sentence of death, but his courage deserted him as the time for execution approached. He had such a dread of falling into the hands of the surgeons that he wrote to several friends begging them to rescue his body if any attempt should be made at the gallows to remove it. He was hanged at Tyburn on the 30th of April, 1725, but the calendar does not state what happened to his corpse. George Price, who murdered his wife in 1738, had an analogous motive. He wished to release himself from one tie in order to enter into another. He was in service in Kent, his wife lived in lodgings in Highgate, and their family increased far more rapidly than he liked. Having for some time paid his addresses to a widow in Kent, he at length resolved to remove the only obstacle to a second and more profitable marriage. With this infernal object in view, he went to Highgate, and told his wife that he had secured a place for her at Putney, to which he would himself drive her in a chaise. She was warned by some of his fellow-servants against trusting herself alone with him, but she said she had no fear of him, as he had treated her with unusual kindness. They drove off towards Hounslow. On the way, she begged him to stop while she bought some snuff, but he refused, laughingly declaring that she would never want to use snuff again.' 
When they reached Hounslow Heath, it was nearly ten o'clock at night. The time and place being suitable, he suddenly threw his whip-lash round his wife's throat and drew it tight. As the cord was not quite in the right place, he coolly altered it, and disregarding her entreaties, he again tightened the rope, then, finding she was not quite dead, pulled it with such violence that it broke, but not till the murder was accomplished. Having stripped the body, he disfigured it, as he hoped beyond recognition, then left it under a gibbet on which some malefactors were hanging in chains, and returned to London with his wife's clothes, part of which he dropped around the street, and part he gave back to her landlady to whom they belonged. Being seen about, so many inquiries were made for his wife that he feared detection and fled to Portsmouth. Next day, he heard the murder cried through the streets by the bellman, and found that it was his own case, with an exact description of his appearance. He at once jumped out of the window, the inn was by the waterside, and swam to another part of the shore. Thence he made his way into the country, and got chance jobs as a farm laborer. At Oxford he found that he was advertised in the local paper, and he again decamped, travelling on and on till he reached his own home in Wales. His father gave him refuge for a couple of days, but a report of his being in the house got about, and he had to fly to Gloucester, where he became an ostler at an inn. In Gloucester he was again recognized as the man who had killed his wife on Hounslow Heath, by a gentleman who promised not to betray him, but warned him that he would be taken into custody if he remained in town. Agitated by the momentary fear of detection, Price knew not how to act, and he resolved at length to go back to London and give himself up to justice. He called first on his former master, was apprehended and committed to Newgate. He took his trial in due course, and was, on the strongest circumstantial evidence ever adduced against an offender, cast for death, but fell a victim to the jail fever in October 1738. Mention of two more heinous cases of wife murder may be made. The second marriage of Edward Joynes, contracted at the fleet, was not a happy one. His wife had a violent temper, and they continually disagreed. A daughter of hers lived with them, and the two women contrived to aggravate and annoy Joynes to desperation. He retaliated by brutal treatment. On one occasion he pushed his wife into the grate and scorched her arm. Frequently he drove her out of doors in scanty clothing at late hours and in inclement weather. One day his anger was roused by seeing a pot of ale going into his house for his wife, who was laid up with a fractured arm. He rushed in, and after striking the tankard out of her hand, seized her by the bad arm, twisted it till the bone again separated. The fracture was reset, but mortification rapidly supervened, and she died within ten days. The coroner's jury, in consequence, brought in a verdict of willful murder against Joynes. He was in due course convicted of murder, although it was difficult to persuade him that he had had a fair trial, seeing that his wife did not succumb immediately to the cruel injury she had received at his hands. In December 1739 he was executed. The second wife of John Williamson received still more terrible and inhumane treatment at his hands. This ruffian, within three weeks after his marriage, drenched his wife with cold water, and having otherwise ill-used her, inflict the following diabolical torture. Having fastened her hands behind with handcuffs, he lifted her off the ground with her toes barely touching it, by a rope run through a staple. She was locked up in a closet, and close by was placed a small piece of bread and butter, which she could just touch with her lips. She was allowed a small portion of water daily. Sometimes a girl who was in the house gave the poor creature a stool to rest her feet on, but Williamson discovered it, and was so furious that he nearly beat the girl to death. The wretched woman was kept in this awful plight for more than a month at a time, and at length succumbed. She died raving mad. Williamson, when arrested, made a frivolous defense, declaring his wife provoked him by treading on a kitten and killing it. In 1760 he was found guilty and executed. The victim of Theodore Gardell was a woman, although not his wife. This murder much exercised the public mind at the time. The perpetrator was a foreigner, a hitherto inoffensive miniature painter, who was goaded into such a frenzy by the intolerable irritation of the woman's tongue, that he first struck and then dispatched her. He lodged with a Mrs. King in Leicester Fields, whose miniature he had painted, but not very successfully. She had desired to have the portrait particularly good, and in her disappointment gave the unfortunate painter no peace. One morning she came into the parlour which he used, and which was en suite with her bedroom, and immediately attacked him about the miniature. Provoked by her insults, Gardell told her she was a very impertinent woman, at which she struck him a violent blow on the chest. 
he pushed her from him rather in contempt than anger, as he afterwards declared, and with no desire to hurt her. Her foot caught in the floor-cloth, she fell backward, and her head came with great force against the sharp corner of the bedstead, for Gardelle apparently had followed her into her bedroom. The blood immediately gushed from her mouth, and he at once ran up to assist her and express his concern, but she pushed him away, threatening him with the consequences of his act. He was greatly terrified at the thought of being charged with a criminal assault, but the more he strove to pacify, the more she reviled and threatened, till at last he seized a sharp-pointed ivory comb which lay upon her toilet table, and drove it into her throat. The blood poured out in still greater volume, and her voice gradually grew fainter and fainter, and she presently expired. Gardelle said afterwards he drew the bedclothes over her, then, horrified and overcome, fell by her side in a swoon. When he came to himself he examined the body to see if Mrs. King were quite dead, and in his confusion staggered against the wainscot, and hid his head so as to raise a great bump over his eye. Gardel now seems to have considered with himself how best he might conceal his crime. There was only one other resident in the house, a maid-servant, who was out on a message for him at the time of his fatal quarrel with Mrs. King. When she returned she found the bedroom locked, and Gardel told her her mistress had gone into the country for the day. Later on he paid her wages on behalf of Mrs. King and discharged her, with the explanation that her mistress intended to bring home a new maid with her. Having now the house to himself, he entered the chamber of death and stripped the body which he laid in the bed. He next disposed of the blood-stained bedclothes by putting them to soak in a wash-tub in the back wash-house. A servant of an absent fellow-lodger came in late and asked for Mrs. King, but Gardell said she had not returned, and that he meant to sit up for her and let her into the house. Next morning he explained Mrs. King's absence by saying she had come late and gone off again for the day. This went on from Wednesday to Saturday, but no suspicion of anything wrong had as yet have been conceived, and the body still lay in the same place in the back room. On Sunday Gardell began to put into execution a project for destroying the body in parts, which he disposed of by throwing them down the sinks or spreading in the cockloft. On Monday and Tuesday inquiries began to be made for Mrs. King, and Gardell continued to say that he expected her daily, but on Thursday the stained bedclothes were found in the wash-tub. Gardell was seen coming up from the wash-house, and was heard to ask what had become of the linen. This roused suspicion for the first time. The discharged maid-servant was hunted up, and as she declared she knew nothing of the wash-tub or its contents, and as Mrs. King was still missing, the neighbors began to move in the matter. Mr. Barron, an apothecary, came and questioned Gardell, who was so much confused in his answers that a warrant was obtained for his arrest. Then Mrs. King's bedroom was examined, and that of Gardell, now a prisoner. In both were found conclusive evidence of foul play. By and by, in the cockloft and elsewhere, portions of the missing woman were discovered, and some jewelry known to be hers was traced to Gardell, who did not long deny his guilt. When he was in the new prison in Clerkenwell, he tried to commit suicide by taking forty drops of opium, but it failed even to procure him sleep. After this he swallowed halfpence to the number of twelve, hoping that the verdigrees would kill him, but he survived after suffering great tortures. He was removed then to Newgate for greater security, and was closely watched till the end. After a fair trial, he was convicted and cast for death. His execution took place in the Haymarket near Panton Street, to which he was led past Mrs. King's house, and at which he cast one glance as he passed. His body was hanged in chains on Hounslow Heath. End of section 14「Section fifteen of the Chronicles of Newgate, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The Chronicles of Newgate, Volume One by Arthur Griffiths. Later Records, Part Two. Women were as capable of fiendish cruelty as men, and displayed greater and more diabolical ingenuity in devising torments for their victims. Two murders typical of this class of crime may be quoted here. One was that committed by the Meatyard's mother and daughter upon an apprentice girl, the other that of Elizabeth Brownrigg, also on an apprentice. The Meatyard's kept a millinery shop in Bruton Street berkeley square and had five parish apprentices bound to them one was a sickly girl ann taylor by name 
being unable to do as much work as her employers desired they continually vented their spite upon her after enduring great cruelty ann taylor absconded she was caught brought back to bruton street and imprisoned in a garret on bread and water she again escaped and was again recaptured and cruelly beaten with a broom handle then they tied her with a rope to the door of a room so that she could neither sit nor lie down and she was so kept for three successive days but suffered to go to bed at night-time on the third night she was so weak she could hardly creep upstairs on the fourth day her fellow apprentices were brought to witness her torments as an incentive to exertion but were forbidden to afford her any kind of relief on this the last day of her torture she faltered in speech and presently expired the meat-yards now tried to bring their victim to with hartshorn but finding life was extinct they carried the body up to the garret and locked it in then four days later they enclosed it in a box left the garret door ajar and spread a report through their house that nanny had once more absconded the deceased had a sister a fellow apprentice who declared she was persuaded nanny was dead whereupon the meat yards also murdered the sister and secreted the body anne's body remained in the garret for a couple of months when the stench of decomposition was so great that the murderesses feared detection and after chopping the corpse in pieces they burnt parts and disposed of others in drains and gully holes four years elapsed without suspicion having been aroused but there had been constant and violent quarrels between mother and daughter the former frequently beating and ill-using the latter who in return reviled her mother as a murderess during this time the daughter left her home to live with a mr rooker as servant at ealing her mother followed her and still behaved so outrageously that the daughter in mr rooker's presence upbraided her with what they had done he became uneasy and cross-questioned them till they confessed the crime both women were arrested and tried at the old bailey where they were convicted and sentenced to death the mother on the morning of her execution was taken with a fit from which she never recovered and she was in a state of insensibility when hanged elizabeth brownrigg was the wife of a plumber who carried on business in flower de luce court fleet street she practised midwifery and received parish apprentices whom she took to save the expense of keeping servants two girls victims of her cruel ill-usage ran away but a third mary clifford bound to her by the parish of white friars remained to endure still worse her inhuman mistress repeatedly beat her now with a hearth broom now with a horsewhip or a cane the girl was forced to lie at nights in a coal hole with no bed but a sack and some straw she was often nearly perished with cold once after a long diet of bread and water when nearly starved to death she rashly broke into a cupboard in search of food and was caught in the act mrs brownrigg to punish her made her strip and while she was naked repeatedly beat her with the butt end of a whip then fastening a jack chain around her neck she drew it as tight as possible without strangling and sent her back to the coal hole with her hands tied behind her back mrs brownrigg's son vied with his mother in ill-treating the apprentices and when the mistress was tired of horsewhipping the lad continued the savage punishment when mary clifford complained to a french lodger of the barbarity she experienced mrs brownrigg flew at her and cut her tongue in two places with a pair of scissors other apprentices were equally ill-used and they were all covered with wounds and bruises from the cruel flagellations they received at length one of the neighbors alarmed by the constant moaning and groanings which issued from brownrigg's house began to suspect that the apprentices were treated with unwarrantable severity it was impossible to gain admission but a maid looked through a skylight into a covered yard and saw one of the apprentices in a shocking state of filth and wretchedness kept there with a pig one of the overseers now went and demanded mary clifford mrs brownrigg produced another mary mitchell who was taken to the workhouse but in such a pitiable state 
that in removing her clothes her bodice stuck to her wounds mary mitchell having been promised that she should not be sent back to mrs brownrigg's gave a full account of the horrid treatment she and mary clifford had received a further search was made in the brownrigg's house but without effect at length under threat of removal to prison mrs brownrigg produced clifford from a cupboard under a buffet in the dining-room it is impossible says the account to describe the miserable appearance of this poor girl nearly her whole body was ulcerated her life was evidently in imminent danger having been removed to st bartholomew's hospital she died there within a few days the man brownrigg was arrested but the woman and son made their escape shifting their abode from place to place buying new disguises from time to time at rag fairs eventually they took refuge in lodgings at wandsworth where they were recognized by their landlord as answering the description of the murderers of mary clifford and arrested mrs brownrigg was tried and executed the men acquitted of the graver charge were only sentenced to six months imprisonment the story runs that hogarth who prided himself on his skill as a physiognomist wished to see mrs brownrigg in newgate the governor mr ackerman admitted him but at the instance of a mutual friend played a trick upon the painter by bringing mrs brownrigg before him casually as some other woman hogarth on looking at her took ackerman aside and said you must have two great female miscreants in your custody for this woman as well as mrs brownrigg is from her features capable of any cruelty and any crime this story although bien trovato is apocryphal at the time of this alleged visit to newgate hogarth was not alive i pass now to murders of less atrocity the result of temporary and more or less ungovernable passion rather than of malice deliberate and a forethought in this class be included the case of mr plunkett a young gentleman of irish extraction who murdered a peruke maker when asked an exorbitant price for a wig brown had made it to order for mr plunkett and wanted seven pounds for it after haggling he reduced it to six plunkett offered four and on this being refused seized a razor lying handy and cut brown's throat a somewhat similar case was that of mr edward bird a well-born youth who had been educated at eton and after making the grand tour had received a commission in a regiment of horse unfortunately he led a wild dissolute life associating with low characters one morning after spending the night in a place of public resort he ordered a bath one waiter deputed the job to another the latter went to bird to apologize for the delay bird growing furious drew his sword and made several passes at the waiter who avoided them by holding the door in his hand and then escaped downstairs bird pursued threw the man down breaking his ribs on this the master of the house and another waiter by name oxton tried to appease bird but the latter frantic at not having the bath when ordered fell upon loxton and ran him through with his sword loxton dropped and died almost instantaneously bird was arrested committed to newgate and eventually tried for his life he was convicted and received sentence of death but great interest was made to get it commuted to transportation his powerful friends might have attained it but for the protests of loxton's representatives and bird was ordered for execution the night before he first tried poison then stabbed himself in several places but survived to be taken the following morning to tyburn in a mourning coach attended by his mother and the ordinary of newgate at the gallows he asked for a glass of wine and a pinch of snuff which he took with apparent unconcern wishing health to those who stood near him and then repeated the apostles creed and was launched into eternity the military were not over popular at times when party disputes ran high and the soldiery were often exposed to contumely in the streets it must be admitted too that they were ready enough to accept any quarrel fastened upon them thus william hawksworth a guardsman while marching through the park with a party to relieve guard at st james left the ranks to strike a woman who he thought had insulted his cloth it was not she however but her companion who had cried 
what a stir there is about king george's soldiers this companion by name ransom resented the blow and called hawksworth a puppy whereupon the soldier clubbed his musket and knocked the civilian down hawksworth marched on with his guard ransom was removed to the hospital with a fractured skull and died in a few hours but a bystander having learned the name of the offender obtained a warrant against hawksworth who was committed to newgate he was ably defended at his trial and his commanding officer gave him an excellent character but the facts were so clearly proved that conviction was imperative for some time he was buoyed up with the hope of reprieve but this failed him at the last and he went to tyburn solemnly declaring that ransom hit him first that he had no malice against the deceased and he hardly remembered leaving the ranks to strike him two cases may well be inserted here although belonging to a somewhat later date both were murders committed under the influence of strong excitement one was the fierce outburst of passionate despair at unrequited love the other the rash action of a quick-tempered man who was bested for the moment with absolute power the first was the murder of miss ray by the rev james hackman the second the flogging to death of the sergeant armstrong by order of colonel wall lieutenant governor of gorey mr hackman had held a commission in the sixty-eighth foot and while employed on the recruiting service at hunting don had been hospitably received at hinching broke the seat of lord sandwich at that time a miss ray resided there under the protection of his lordship by whom she had had nine children hackman fell desperately in love with miss ray and the lady did not altogether reject his attentions a correspondence between them which bears every appearance of authenticity was published after the murder under the title of love and madness and the letters on both sides are full of ardent protestations hackman continued to serve for some time but the exile from the sight of his beloved became so intolerable that he sold out took orders and entered the church obtaining eventually the living of wiverton in norfolk he had determined to marry miss ray if she would accept him and one of the last letters of the correspondence above quoted proves that the marriage arrangements were all but completed on the first march seventeen seventy nine he writes in a month or six weeks at farthest from this time i might certainly call you mine only remember that my character now i have taken orders renders exhibition necessary by to-night's post i shall write into north about the alterations at our parsonage but within a few weeks a cloud overshadowed his life it is only vaguely indicated in a letter to a friend dated the twentieth march in which he hints at a rupture between miss ray and himself what i shall do i know not without her i do not think i can exist a few days later he wrote to the same friend despair goads me on death only can relieve me what then have i to do who only lived when she loved me but cease to live now she ceases to love at this period it is evident that the idea of suicide only occupied his overwrought brain he wrote on the seventh april when this reaches you i shall be no more you know where my affections were placed my having by some means or other lost hers an idea which i could not support has driven me to madness so far he does not appear to have contemplated any violence against miss ray for in his letter he commends her to the kind offices of his friend he spent that day in self-communing and in reading a volume of dr blair's sermons in the evening he went from his lodgings in duke's court st martin's lane towards the admiralty and saw miss ray drive by to the convent garden theatre he followed her into the theatre and gazed at her for the last time then unable to restrain the violence of his passion he returned to his lodgings and having loaded two pistols returned to convent garden where he waited in the piazza till the play was over when miss ray came out he stepped up with a pistol in each hand one he fired at her and killed her on the spot the other he discharged at himself but without fatal effect he was at once arrested and when his wound had been dressed was committed by sir john fielding to tothill fields and afterwards to newgate he wrote from prison to the same friend as follows i am alive and she is dead i shot her shot her and not myself some of her blood and brains are still upon my clothes 
i don't ask you to speak to me i don't ask you to look at me only come hither and bring me a little poison such as is strong enough upon my knees i beg if your friendship for me ever was sincere do do bring me some poison next day he was more composed and declared that nothing should tempt him to escape justice by suicide my death he writes is all the recompense i can make to the laws of my country he was tried before mr justice blackstone of the commentaries and convicted on the clearest evidence a plea of insanity was set up in his defence but could not be maintained his dignified address to the jury had nothing of madness in it and it is probable that he had no real desire to escape the judgment for his crime this is shown by his answer to lord sandwich who wrote seventeenth april seventeen seventy nine to mr hackman in newgate if the murderer of miss wishes to live the man he has most injured will use all his interests to procure his life to this hackman replied the condemned cell in newgate seventeenth april seventeen seventy nine the murderer of her whom he preferred far preferred to life respects the hand from which he has just received such an offer as he neither desires nor deserves his wishes are for death not life one wish he has could he be pardoned in this world by the man he has most injured oh my lord when i meet her in another world enable me to tell her if departed spirits are not ignorant of earthly things that you forgive us both that you will be a father to her dear infants j h the condemned man continued to fill many sheets with his reflections in the shape of letters to his friend but they are all rhapsodical to the last degree the nineteenth april was the day fixed for his execution and on that morning he rose at five o'clock dressed himself and spent some time in private meditation about seven o'clock he was visited by mr boswell and some other friends with whom he went to the chaplain and partook of the sacrament during the procession to tyburn he seemed much affected and said but little after having hung the usual time his body was carried to surgeon's hall he appears to have written a few last words in pencil at tyburn while actually waiting to be turned off my dear charlie he wrote farewell for ever in this world i die a sincere christian and penitent and everything i hope you can wish me would it prevent my examples having any bad effect if the world should know how i abhor my former ideas of suicide my crime will be the best judge of her fame i charge you to be careful my pearly will your dying age miss ray was buried at elstree hertz where her grave is still pointed out twenty years elapsed between the commission of the murder with which governor wall was charged and his trial and atonement the date of his execution was eighteen o two a date which would bring the story within the scope of a later rather than the present chapter but while postponing the particulars of the execution i propose to deal here with the offence as it falls naturally into this branch of my subject colonel wall was governor and commandant of gorey a small island off the coast of africa close to cape verde and now in the possession of the french it was mainly dependent upon england for its supplies and when these ran short as was often the case the troops received a money compensation in lieu of rations a sum was due to them in this way on one occasion when both the governor and paymaster were on the point of leaving the island for england and a number of men anxious for an adjustment of their claims set off in a body to interview the paymaster at his quarters they were encountered en route by the governor who reprimanded them and ordered them to return to their barracks an hour or two later a second party started for the paymaster at the head of which was a certain sergeant armstrong the governor met them as before and addressing himself to sergeant armstrong again ordered the men back to their quarters upon the nature of this demonstration the whole of the subsequent proceedings hinged governor wall and his witnesses declared it was a tumultuous gathering seventy or eighty strong other testimony limited the number to about a dozen governor wall alleged that the men with armstrong were armed and menacing others that they comported themselves in a quiet orderly manner it was sworn that armstrong when spoken to by the governor came up to him submissively hat in hand 
addressed him as your excellency used no disrespectful language and withdrew with his comrades without noise or disturbance this view was supported by the evidence of several officers who swore that they saw no appearance of a mutiny on the island that day on the other hand the governor urged that the men had declared they would break open the stores and help themselves if they were not settled with at once that they prevented him from going to the shore fearing he meant to leave the island in a hurry and that they forced the main guard and released a prisoner it is difficult to reconcile statements so widely divergent but the fact that governor ball left the island next day and took with him three officers out of the seven in the garrison that he made no special report of the alleged mutiny to the military authorities in london and did not even refer to it in minute returns prepared and forwarded at the time must be deemed very detrimental to governor wall's case and no doubt weighed with the jury which tried him the only conclusion was that no mutiny existed but one was assumed merely to screen the infliction of an unauthorized punishment to return to the events on the island it is pretty certain that governor wall's mind must have been thrown off its balance after he had dismissed the party headed by armstrong he was either actually apprehensive for the safety of his command or was momentarily blinded by passion at the seeming defiance of discipline and he felt that he must make an example if his authority was to be maintained although many old comrades of high rank bore witness at his trial to his great humanity and good temper there is reason to fear that to those under his command he was so severe and unaccommodating as to be generally unpopular and this no doubt told against him at his trial he was not a strong self-reliant commander it is nearly certain that he gave trifles exaggerated importance and was only too ready to put in practice the severest methods of repression he had at hand in this instance however he did not act without deliberation it was not until six in the evening that he had resolved to punish armstrong as the ringleader of the mutiny by that time he had fully laid his plans the long roll was beat upon the drums the troops were assembled hurriedly as in the case of alarm and a gun carriage was dragged into the centre of the parade the governor then constituted a drumhead court-martial which proceeded to try armstrong for mutiny convict and sentence him without calling upon him to plead to any charge or hearing him in his defence so that he was practically punished without a trial he was ordered eight hundred lashes which were forthwith inflicted not as in ordinary cases by the regimental drummers whom the governor thought were tinged with insubordination but by the black interpreters and his assistants nor was the regulation cat of nine tails used as the governor declared they had all been destroyed by the mutineers but a very thick rope's end which according to the surgeon's testimony did more mischief than the cat armstrong's punishment was exemplary it was proved that the governor stood by threatening to flog the blacks themselves unless they laid on with a will and crying again and again cut him to the heart cut him to the liver armstrong begged for mercy but he received the whole eight hundred lashes twenty-five at a time and when he was cast loose he said that the sick season was coming on which with the punishment would certainly do for him a surgeon was present at the infliction but was not called upon to certify as to armstrong's fitness or otherwise for corporal punishment nor did he enter any protest armstrong was taken at once to hospital and his back was found as black as a new hat from the moment of his reception the doctors had no hope of his recovery he gradually grew worse and worse and presently died the day after the punishment governor wall left gorey and came to england where he arrived in august seventeen eighty two the news of armstrong's death followed him and various reports as to the governor's conduct which were inquired into and dismissed but in seventeen eighty four a more detailed and circumstantial account came to hand and two messengers were dispatched to bath by lord sidney then secretary of state to arrest wall they apprehended him and brought him as far as reading in a chaise and four where they alighted at an inn while the officers were at supper he gave them the slip and got over to france 
whence he wrote promising to surrender in the course of a few months his excuse for absconding was that many of those who would be the principal witnesses were his personal enemies he continued abroad however for some years residing sometimes in italy more constantly in france where he lived respectably and was admitted into good company he affected the society of countrymen serving in the french army and was well known to the scotch and irish colleges in paris in seventeen ninety seven he returned to england and remained in hiding occupying lodgings in lambeth court where his wife who was a lady of good family regularly visited him he was described as being unsettled in mind at this time and even then contemplating surrender his means of subsistence were rather precarious but he lived at the time of delivering himself up in upper thornhow street bedford square in october eighteen o one he wrote twice to lord pelham stating that he had returned to england for the purpose of meeting the charge against him it was generally supposed that had he not thus come forward voluntarily the matter had nearly passed out of people's memory and he would hardly have been molested he was however arrested on his own letter committed to newgate and tried at the old bailey for the murder of benjamin armstrong at gorey in seventeen eighty two he was found guilty and sentenced to death after several respites and strenuous exertions to save his life he was executed in front of newgate on the twenty eighth january eighteen o two the whole of one day was occupied by the judges and law officers in reviewing his case but their opinion was against him three persons of note and superior station found themselves in newgate about but rather before this time upon a charge of murder the first was james quinn the celebrated actor the popular diner out and bon vivant who went to the west coast of england to eat john dory in perfection and who preferred eating turtle in bristol to london he made his first hit as falstaff in the merry wives of windsor he had understudied the part but rich manager of the theatre royal london's inn fields substituted him for it in an emergency with great reluctance his next hit was as cato in which with many other parts he succeeded booth quinn was modest enough on his first appearance as cato to announce that the part would be attempted by mr quinn the audience were however fully satisfied with his performance and after one critical passage was applauded with shouts of booth outdone it was through this his great part cato that he was led into the quarrel which laid him open to the charge of murder one night in seventeen sixty nine an inferior actor named williams taking the part of messenger said caesar sends health to cato but pronounced cato quito quinn much annoyed replied instantly with a gag would that he had sent a better messenger williams was now greatly incensed and in the green room later in the evening complained bitterly to quinn that he had been made ridiculous that his professional prospects were blighted and that he insisted upon satisfaction or an apology quinn only laughed at his rage williams goaded to madness went out into the piazza at convent garden to watch for quinn when the latter left the theatre williams attacked him with his sword quinn drew in his defence and after a few passes ran williams through the body the ill-fated actor died on the spot quinn surrendered himself was committed tried found guilty of manslaughter and was sentenced to be burned in the hand another well-known actor charles macklin was no less unfortunate in incurring the stain of blood he was a hot-headed intemperate irishman who when he had an engagement at drury lane theatre quarrelled with another actor over a wig going down between the pieces into the scene-room where the players warmed themselves he saw a mr hallam who was to appear as sancho in the fop's fortune wearing a stock wig which he macklin had on the night before he swore at him for a rogue and cried what business have you with my wig the other answered that he had as much right to it as macklin but presently went away and changed it for another macklin still would not leave the man alone and taking the wig began to comb it out making grumbling and abusive remarks and a scrub rascal hallam replied that he was no more a rascal than macklin was upon which the latter started from his chair and having a stick in his hand made a full lunge at the actor 
and thrust the stick into his left eye pulling it back again he looked pale turned on his heel and in a passion threw the stick on the fire hallam clapped his hand to his eye and said the stick had gone through his head young mr sibber the manager's son came in and a doctor was sent for the injured man was removed to a bed where he expired the following day macklin was very contrite and concerned at his rash act for which he was arrested and in due course tried at the old bailey many of the most renowned actors of the day rich fleetwood quinn ryan and others bore testimony to his good character and his quiet peaceable disposition he also was found guilty of manslaughter only and sentenced to be burnt in the hand the third case of killing by misadventure was that of joseph baretti the author of the well-known italian and english dictionary baretti had resided in england for some years engaged upon this work he was a middle-aged respectable man of studious habits the friend and associate of the most noted literary men and artists of the day he was a member of the club of the royal academicians at that time seventeen sixty nine lodged in soho and went there one afternoon after a long morning's work over his proofs finding no one at the club he went on to the orange coffee-house and returning by the haymarket to the club was madly assaulted by a woman at the corner of panton street very unwisely he resented her attack by giving her a blow with his hand when the woman finding by his accent he was a foreigner cried for help against the cursed frenchman when there was at once a gathering of bullies who jostled and beat baretti making him apprehensive that he must expect no favor nor protection but all outrage and blows there was generally a great puddle at the corner of hanton street even when the weather was fine and on this particular day it had rained incessantly and the pavement was very slippery baretti's assailants tried hard to push him into the puddle and at last in self-defence he drew his pocket-knife a knife he kept as he afterwards declared to carve fruit and sweetmeats and not to kill his fellow-creatures with being hard pushed in great horror having such bad eyes lest he should run against some and his pursuers constantly at him jostling and beating him baretti made a quick blow at one who had knocked off his hat with his fist the mob cried murder he has a knife out and gave way baretti ran up oxenden street then faced about and ran into a shop for protection being quite spent with fatigue three men followed him one was a constable who had called upon baretti to surrender morgan the man whom he had stabbed three times as it appeared the third wound having hurt him more than the two former was fast bleeding to death baretti was carried before sir john fielding his friends came from the club and testified to his character among others sir joshua reynolds himself but he was committed to prison it was urged in baretti's defence that he had been very severely handled he had a swollen cheek and was covered with bruises independent witnesses came forward and swore that they had been subjected to personal outrage in the neighbourhood of the haymarket a number of personal friends including sir joshua reynolds dr johnson mr fitzherbert and mr edmund burke spoke in the highest terms of mr baretti as a man of benevolence sobriety modesty and learning in the end he was acquitted of murder or manslaughter and the jury gave a verdict of self-defence end of later records part two section sixteen of the chronicles of newgate volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the chronicles of newgate volume one by author griffiths chapter ten highwaymen and pirates chronic dangers and riots in the london streets Footman's Riot at Drury Lane James McLean, a notorious knight of the road, has a lodging in St. James Street. Stops Horace Walpole, hanged at Maidstone. John Rann, alias Sixteen String Jack. Short career ends on the gallows. William Parsons, a baronet's son, turns swindler and is transported to Virginia.
Jonathan Wilde, the sham thief-taker and notorious criminal Captain Kidd, English peers accused of complicity, Kidd's arrest, trial, and sentence. John Gow and his career in The Revenge, his death at execution dock. Inoffensive persons were constantly in danger day and night of being waylaid and maltreated in the streets. Disturbance was chronic in certain localities, and a trifling quarrel might at any moment blaze into a murderous riot. On execution days, the mob was always rampant. At times, too, when political passion was at fever heat, crowds of roughs were ever ready to espouse the popular cause. Thus, when the court party headed by Lord Bute vainly strove to crush the demagogue John Wilkes, and certain prisoners were being tried at the Old Bailey for riot and wounding, a crowd collected outside the mansion house, carrying a gibbet on which hung a boot and a petticoat. The mayor interfered, and a fray began. Weapons were used. Some of the Lord Mayor's servants were wounded, and one of the prisoners was rescued by the mob. Sometimes the disturbance had its origin in trade jealousies. An especially turbulent class were the footmen, chairmen, and body servants of the aristocracy. The footmen's riot at Drury Lane Theatre, which occurred in 1737, was a serious affair. It had long been the custom to admit the party-colored tribe, as the licensed lackeys are called in the contemporary accounts, to the upper gallery of that theatre, gratis, out of compliment to their masters, on whom they were in attendance. Then, when established among the gods, they comported themselves with extraordinary license. They impudently insulted the rest of the audience, who, unlike themselves, had paid for admission, and, assuming the prerogative of critics, hissed or applauded with the most offensive clamor. Finding the privilege of free entrance thus scandalously abused, Mr. Fleetwood, the manager, suspended the free list. This gave great offense to the footmen, who proceeded to take the law into their own hands. They conceived, as it was stated in Fogg's weekly journal, that they had an indefeasible hereditary right to the said gallery, and that this expulsion was a high infringement of their liberties. Accordingly, one Saturday night, a great number of them, quite three hundred, it was said, assembled at Drury Lane doors, armed with staves and truncheons, and well fortified with three threads and two penny. The night selected was one when the performance was patronized by royalty, and the Prince and Princess of Wales, with other members of the royal family, were in the theatre. The rioters attacked the stage door and forced it open, bearing down on all the box-keepers, candle-snuffers, supernumeraries, and pippin women that stood in the way. In this onslaught, some five-and-twenty respectable people were desperately wounded. Fortunately, Colonel de Vale, an active Westminster justice, happened to be in the house, and at once interposed. He ordered the riot act be read. But so great was the confusion, says the account, that they might as well have read Caesar's commentaries. Colonel de Vale then got the assistance of some of the guards, and with them seized several of the principal rioters whom he committed to Newgate. The prisoners were looked upon as martyrs to the great cause, and while in jail were liberally supplied with all luxuries by the subscription of their brethren. They were, however, brought to trial, convicted of riot, and sentenced to imprisonment. This did not quite end the disturbance. Anonymous letters poured into the theatre threatening Fleetwood and vowing vengeance. The following is a specimen. Sir, we are willing to admonish you before we attempt our design, and provide you use us civil and admit us into your gallery, which is our property according to formalities, and if you think proper to come to a composition, this way you'll hear no further, and if not, our intention is to combine in a body incognito and reduce the playhouse to the ground. Valuing no detection, we are indemnified. The manager carried these letters to the Lord Chamberlain and appealed to him for protection. A detachment of guards, fifty strong, was ordered to do duty at the theatre nightly, and thus deterred the saucy knaves from carrying their threats into execution. From this time, says the Newgate Calendar, the gallery has been purged of such vermin. <laughs>
the footmen and male servants generally of this age were an idle dissolute race from among them the ranks of the highwaymen were commonly recruited and it was very usual for the gentleman's gentleman who had long flaunted in his master's apparel and imitated his master's vices to turn gentlemen on the road to obtain funds for the faro table and riotous living a large proportion of the most famous highwaymen of the eighteenth century had been in service at some time or other hawkins james mclean john wren william page had all worn the livery coat john hawkins had been butler to a gentleman's family but lost his place when the plate chest was robbed and suspicion fell upon him because he was flush of money hawkins without a character was unable to get a fresh place and he took at once to the road his operations which were directed chiefly against persons of quality were conducted in and about london he stopped and robbed the earl of burlington lord bruce and the earl of westmoreland the latter in lincoln's inn fields when he got valuable jewels he carried them over to holland and disposed of them for cash which he squandered at once in a hell for he was a rash and inveterate gambler working with two associates he made his headquarters at a public house in the london wall the master of which kept a livery stable and shared in the booty from this point they rode out at all hours and stopped the stages as they came into town laden with passengers one of the gang was however captured in the act of robbing the mail and executed at aylesbury after this by way of revenge they all determined to turn mail robbers they first designed to stop the harwich mail but changed their mind as its arrival was uncertain being dependent on the passage of the packet-boat and determined to rob the bristol mail instead they overtook the boy carrying the bags near slough and made him go down a lane where they tied him to a tree in a wet ditch ransacked the bath and bristol bags and hurried off by a circuitous route to london where they divided the spoil sharing the banknotes and throwing the letters into the fire soon after this the post office having learned that the public house in the london wall was the resort of highwaymen it was closely watched one of hawkins gang became alarmed and was on the point of bolting to newcastle when he was arrested he was hesitating whether or not he should confess when he found that he had been forestalled by an associate who had already given information to the post office and he also made a clean breast of it all the rest of the gang were taken at their lodgings in the old bailey but not without a fight and committed to newgate hawkins tried to set up an alibi and an innkeeper swore that he lodged with him at bedfordbury on the night of the robbery but the jury found him guilty and he was hanged at tyburn his body being afterwards hung in chains on hounslow heath the defense of an alibi was very frequently pleaded by highwaymen and the tradition of its utility may explain why that veteran and astute coachman mr weller suggested it in the case of bardell versus pickwick in one genuine case however it nearly failed and two innocent men were all but sacrificed to mistaken identity they had been arrested for having robbed on the uxbridge road a learned sergeant-at-law sir thomas davenport who swore positively to both his evidence was corroborated by that of lady davenport and by the coachman and footman also the horses ridden by the supposed highwaymen one a brown and the other a gray were produced in the old bailey courtyard and sworn to yet it was satisfactorily proved that both the prisoners were respectable residents of kentish town that one at the exact time of the robbery was seated at a table dining at some club anniversary dinner and never left the club room that the other was employed continuously in the bar of a public house kept by his mother it was proved too that the prisoners owned a brown and a gray horse respectively the judge summed up in the prisoners favor and they were acquitted but both suffered severe mental trouble from the unjust accusation a few years later the actual robbers were convicted of another offence and in the cells of newgate confessed that it was they who had stopped sir thomas davenport a very notorious highwayman who had also been in service at one time of his varied career was james mclean he was the son of a dissenting minister in monaghan and had a brother a minister at the hague mclean inherited a small fortune which he speedily dissipated 
after which he became a gentleman's butler, lost his situation through dishonesty, determined to enlist in the horse guards, abandoned the idea, and turned fortune hunter. He was a vain man of handsome exterior, which he decked out in smart clothes on borrowed money. He succeeded at length in winning the daughter of a respectable London horse dealer, and with her dowry of five hundred pounds, set up in business as a grocer. His wife dying early, he at once turned his stock and trade into cash, and again looked to win an heiress, by the gracefulness of his person and the elegance of his appearance. He was at last reduced to his last shilling, and being quite despondent, an Irish apothecary, who was a daring robber, persuaded him to take to the highway. One of his earliest exploits was to stop Horace Walpole when the latter was passing through Hyde Park. A pistol went off accidentally in the encounter, and the bullet not only grazed Walpole's cheekbone, but went through the roof of the carriage. At this time, McLean had a lodging in St. James Street, for which he paid two guineas a week. His accomplice Plunkett lived in German Street. Their faces, says Horace Walpole, are as well known about St. James as any gentleman's who lives in that quarter, and who perhaps goes upon the road, too. McLean accounted for his style of living by putting out that he had Irish property worth seven hundred pounds a year. Once, when he had narrowly escaped capture, he went over to his brother in Holland for safety, and when the danger was past, he returned and recommenced his depredations. He made so good a show that he was often received into respectable houses, and once was near marrying a young lady of good position, but he was recognized and exposed by a gentleman who knew him. McLean continued to rob, with still greater boldness, till the 26th June, 1750. On this day, he and Plunkett robbed the Earl of Eglinton on Hounslow Heath. Later in the day, they stopped and rifled the Salisbury stage, and among the booty carried off two portamentos, which were conveyed to McLean's lodgings in St. James. Information of this robbery was quickly circulated with a description of the stolen goods. McLean had stripped the lace off of a waistcoat, the property of one of his victims, and recklessly offered it for sale to the very laceman from whom it had been purchased. He also sent for another salesman who immediately recognized the clothes offered as those which had been stolen, and pretending to go home for more money, he fetched a constable and apprehended McLean. He made an elaborate defense when brought to trial, but it availed him little, and he was sentenced to death. While under condemnation, he became quite a popular hero. The first Sunday after his trial, says Horace Walpole, 3,000 people went to see him. He fainted away twice with the heat of his cell. You can't conceive the ridiculous rage there is for going to Newgate, and the prints that are published of the malefactors, and the memoirs of their lives, set forth with as much parade as Marshal Turin's. McLean suffered at Tyburn amidst a great concourse. William Page did a better business as a highwayman than McLean. Page was apprenticed to a haberdasher, but he was a consummate coxcomb, who neglected his shop to dress in the fashion and frequent public places. His relations turned him adrift, and when in the last stage of distress he accepted a footman's place. It was while in livery that he first heard of what highwaymen could do, and conceived the idea of adopting the road as a profession. His first exploits were on the Kentish Road when he stopped the Canterbury stage, his next near Hampton Court. When he had collected some two hundred pounds, he took lodgings in Lincoln's Inn Fields, and passed as a student of law. He learned to dance, frequented assemblies, and was on the point of marrying well when he was recognized as a discharged footman and turned out of doors. He continued his depredations all this time, assisted by a curious map which he had himself drawn, giving the roads round London for twenty miles. His plan was to drive out in a phaeton and pair, when at a distance from town he would turn into some unfrequented place and disguise himself with a grizzle or black wig and put on other clothes. Then saddling on one of his phaeton horses, he went on to the main road and committed a robbery. This effected, he galloped back to his carriage, resumed his former dress, and drove to London. He was often cautioned against himself.
but laughingly said that he had already lost his money once and could now only lose his coat and shirt. He was nearly detected on one occasion when some haymakers discovered his empty phaeton and drove it off with his best clothes. He had just stopped some people who pursued the haymakers with the carriage and accused them of being accomplices in the robbery. Page heard of this and throwing the disguise into a well, went back to town nearly naked where he claimed the carriage, saying the men had stripped him and thrown him into a ditch. The coach builder swore that he had sold him the carriage, and they were committed for trial. But Page did not appear to prosecute. Page after this extended his operation, and in company with one Darwell, an old schoolfellow, committed more than three hundred robberies in three years. He frequented Bath, Tunbridge, Newmarket, and Scarborough, playing deep everywhere and passing for a man of fortune. Darwell and he next worked the roads around London, but while the former was near Seven Oaks, he was captured by Justice Fielding. He turned evidence against Page, who was arrested in consequence at the Golden Lion near Hyde Park, with a wig to disguise him in one pocket and his map of the London roads in another. He was remanded to Newgate and tried for a robbery, of which he was acquitted. Then we moved to Maidstone, and convicted of another for which he was hanged at that place in 1758. John Rann was first a helper, then postboy, then coachman to several gentlemen of position. While in this capacity he dressed in a peculiar fashion, wearing breeches with eight strings at each knee, and was hence nicknamed Sixteen String Jack. Having lost his character, he turned to pickpocket and then took to the road. He was soon afterwards arrested for robbing a gentleman of a watch and some money on the Hounslow Road. The watch was traced to a woman with whom Rand kept company, who owned that she had it from him. Rand denied all knowledge of the transaction, which could not be brought home to him. He appeared in court on this occasion in an extravagant costume. His irons were tied up with blue ribbons, and he carried in his breast a bouquet of flowers as big as a broom. He was fond of fine feathers. Soon afterwards he appeared at a public house in Banaghy Wells, dressed in a scarlet coat, tambour waistcoat, white silk stockings, and laced hat. He gave himself out quite openly as a highwayman, and getting drunk and troublesome he was put out of the house through a window into the road. Later on he appeared at Barnett races in elegant sporting style, his waistcoat being blue satin trimmed with silver. On this occasion he was followed by hundreds who knew him and wished to stare at a man who had made himself so notorious. At last he stopped Dr. Bell, chaplain to the Prince Amelia in the Uxbridge Road, and robbed him of eighteen pence in a common watch in a tortoise-shell case. The latter was traced to the same woman already mentioned, and Rann was arrested coming into her house. Dr. Bell swore to him, and his servant declared that he had seen Rann riding up Acton Hill twenty minutes before the robbery. Rann was convicted on this evidence and suffered at Tyburn in 1774 after a short career of four years. It was not the first time he had seen the gallows. A short time previously he had attended a public execution, and forcing his way into the ring kept by the constables, he begged that he might be allowed to stand there, as he might some day be an actor in the scene instead of a spectator. The road was usually the last resource of the criminally inclined, the last fatal step in the downward career which ended abruptly at the gallows. Dissolute and depraved youths of all classes, often enough gentlemen, undoubtedly well-born, adopted this dangerous profession when at their wit's end for funds. William Butler, who did his work accompanied by his servant Jack, was the son of a military officer. Kent and Essex was his favorite line of country, but London was his headquarters, where they lived in the genteelest lodgings, Jack wearing a livery and the squire dressed in the most elegant manner. A baronet, Sir Simon Clark, was convicted of highway robbery at Winchester Assizes with an associate, Lieutenant Robert Arnott although the former, by the strenuous exertions of his country friends, escaped the death penalty to which he had been sentenced. A very notorious highwayman executed in 1750 was William Parson, 
the son of a baronet who had been at Eton and bore a commission in the Royal Navy. He had hopes of an inheritance from the Duchess of Northumberland, who was a near relative, but her grace altered her will in favor of his sister. He left the navy in a hurry, and abandoned by his friends became quite destitute when his father got him an appointment in the Royal African Company's service. But he soon quarreled with the governor of Fort James on the Gambia, and returned to England again so destitute that he lived on three halfpence for four days and drank water from the street pumps. His father now told him to enlist in the lifeguards, but the necessary purchase money, seventy guineas, was not forthcoming. He then, by personating a brother, obtained an advance on a legacy which an aunt held left the brother, and with these funds made so good a show that he managed to marry a young lady of independent fortune, whose father was dead and had bequeathed her a handsome estate. His friends were so delighted that they obtained him a commission as ensign in a marching regiment, the 34th. He immediately launched into an extravagant expenditure, took a house in Poland Street, kept three saddle horses, a chaise, a pair, and a retinue of servants. He also fell into the hands of a noted gambler and sharper who induced him to play high and fleeced him. Parsons was compelled to sell his commission to meet his liabilities, and still had to evade his creditors by hiding under a false name. From this time he became an irreclaimable vagabond, put to all sorts of shifts and adroit in all kinds of swindles to raise means. Having starved for some time, he shipped as captain of marines on board a galley privateer. He returned and lived by forgery and fraud. One counterfeit draft he drew was on the Duke of Cumberland for five hundred pounds, another on Sir Joseph Hankey and Company. He defrauded tailors out of new uniforms and a hatter out of a hundred and sixty hats which he pretended he had contracted to supply his regiment. He also robbed a jeweler by a pretended marriage of a wedding and several valuable diamond rings. In the forty-five he borrowed a horse from an officer intending to join the rebels, but he only rode as far as Smithfield where he sold the nag and let the officer be arrested as a supposed traitor. He was arrested for obtaining money on a false draft at Ranelagh, tried at Maidstone, sentenced to transportation, and dispatched to Virginia. There, after working as a common slave about seven weeks, a certain Lord F. rescued him and took him as a guest into his house. Parsons robbed Lord F. of a horse and took the highway. With the proceeds of his first robbery, he got a passage back to England. On arriving at Whitehaven, he represented himself as having come into a large estate, and a banker advanced him seventy pounds. With this he came on to London, took lodgings in the West End near Hyde Park Corner, and rapidly got through his cash. Then he hired a horse and rode out onto the Hounslow Heath to stop the first person he met. This became his favorite hunting ground, although he did business also about Kensington and Turnham Green. Once having learnt that a footman was to join his master at Windsor with a portmanteau full of notes and money, he rode out to rob him, but was recognized by an old victim. The latter let him enter the town of Hounslow, then ordered him to surrender. He might still have escaped, but the landlord of the inn where he lodged thought he answered the description of a highwayman who had long infested the neighborhood. Parsons was accordingly detained and removed to Newgate. He was easily identified, and his condemnation for returning from transportation followed as a matter of course. His father and his wife used all their interest to gain him a pardon, but he was deemed too old an offender to be a fit object for mercy. Paul Lewis was another reprobate who began life as a king's officer. He was the son of a country clergyman who got him a commission in the train of artillery. But Lewis ran into debt, deserted from his corps, and took to the sea. He entered the Royal Navy and rose to be first midshipman, then lieutenant. Although courageous in action, he was wicked and base, and while on board the fleet he collected three guineas apiece from his messmates to lay in stores for the West Indian voyages, and bolted with the money. He at once took to the road. His first affair was near Newington Butts when he robbed a gentleman in a chaise, 
he was apprehended for this offence but escaped conviction through an alibi after this he committed a variety of robberies he was captured by a police officer on a night that he had first stopped a lady and gentleman in a chaise and then tried to rob a mr brown at whom he fired mr brown's horse took to fright and threw him but when he got to his feet he found his assailant pinned to the ground by mr pope the police officer who was kneeling on his breast it seemed the lady and gentleman lewis's first victims had warned pope that a highwayman was about and the police officer had ridden forward quickly and seized lewis at the critical moment lewis was conveyed to newgate and in due course sentenced to death such was the baseness and unfeeling profligacy of this wretch says the newgate calendar that when his almost heartbroken father visited him for the first time in newgate and put twelve guineas into his hand to repay his expenses he slipped one of the pieces of gold into the cuff of his sleeve by a dexterous sleight and then opening his hand showed the venerable and reverend old man that there were but eleven upon which his father took another from his pocket and gave it to him to make the number intended having then taken a last farewell of his parent lewis turned round to his fellow prisoners and exultingly exclaimed i have flung the old fellow out of another guinea pope's capture of the highwayman lewis was outdone by that of william belchier a few years previous by william norton a person who according to his own account of himself kept a shop in witch street and who sometimes took a thief norton at the trial told his story as follows the chaise to devises having been robbed two or three times as i was informed i was desired to go into it to see if i could take the thief which i did on the third of june about a half an hour after one in the morning i got into the post chaise the postboy told me the place where he had been stopped was near the halfway house between knightsbridge and kensington as we came near the house the prisoner belchier came to us on foot and said driver stop he held a pistol and tinder-box to the chaise and said your money directly you must not stop this minute your money i said don't frighten us i have but a trifle you shall have it then i said to the gentleman there were three in the chaise give your money i took out a pistol from my coat pocket and from my breeches pocket a five shilling piece and a dollar i held the pistol concealed in one hand and the money in the other i held the money pretty hard he said put it in my hat i let him take the five shilling piece out of my hand as soon as he had taken it i snapped my pistol at him it did not go off he staggered back and held up his hands and said oh lord oh lord i jumped out of the chaise he ran away and i after him about six or seven hundred yards and then took him i hit him a blow on his back he begged for mercy on his knees i took his neckcloth off and tied his hands with it and brought him back to the chaise then i told the gentleman in the chaise that was the errand i came upon and wished them a good journey and brought the prisoner to london no account of the thief taking or of the criminality of the eighteenth century would be complete without some reference to jonathan wilde what this astute villain really was may be best gathered from the various sworn informations on which he was indicted it was set forth that he had been for years the confederate of highwaymen pickpockets burglars shoplifters and other thieves that he had formed a kind of corporation of thieves of which he was head or director and that despite his pretended efforts at detection he procured none to be hanged but those who concealed their booty or refused him his share it was said that he had divided the town and country into districts and had appointed distinct gangs to each who accounted to him for their robberies that he employed another set to rob in churches during divine service and other moving detachments to attend at court on birthdays and balls and at houses of parliament his chosen agents were returned transports who lay quite at his mercy they could not be evidence against him and if they displeased him he could at any time have them hanged these felons he generally lodged in a house of his own where he fed and clothed them and used them in clipping guineas or counterfeiting coin wilde at last had the audacity to occupy a house in the old bailey opposite the present sessions house he himself had been a confederate in numerous robberies in all cases he was a receiver of the goods stolen 
he had under his care several warehouses for concealing the same and owned a vessel for carrying off jewels watches and other valuables to holland where he had a superannuated thief for a factor he also kept in his pay several artists to make alterations and transform watches seals snuff-boxes rings so that they might not be recognized which he used to present to people who could be of service to him it was alleged that he generally claimed as much as half the value of all articles which he pretended to recover and that he never gave up banknotes or paper unless the loser could exactly specify them in order to carry out these vile practices and to gain some credit with the ignorant multitude he usually carried a short silver staff as a badge of authority from the government which he used to produce when he himself was concerned in robbing last of all he was charged with selling human blood in other words of procuring false evidence to convict innocent persons sometimes to prevent them from giving evidence against himself at other times for the sake of the great reward offered by the government wilde's career was brought to an abrupt conclusion by the revelations made by two of his creatures he absconded but was pursued captured and committed to newgate he was tried on several indictments but convicted on that of having maintained a secret correspondence with felons receiving money for restoring stolen goods and dividing it with the thieves whom he did not prosecute while under sentence of death he made desperate attempts to obtain a pardon but in vain and at last tried to evade the gallows by taking a large dose of laudanum this also failed and he was conveyed to tyburn amidst the execrations of a countless mob of people who pelted him with stones and dirt all the way among the curious facts concerning this arch villain it is recorded that when at the acme of his prosperity jonathan wilde was ambitious of becoming a freeman of the city of london his petition to this effect is contained among the records of the town clerk's office and set forth that the petitioner has been at great trouble and charge in apprehending and convicting divers felons for returning from transportation from october seventeen twenty that your petitioner has never received any reward or gratuity for such his service and that he is very desirous of becoming a freeman of this honorable city the names follow and include mall king john jones etc who were notorious street robbers the petition is endorsed as read january second seventeen twenty four but the results are not stated before closing this chapter i must refer briefly to another class of highway robbers the pirates and rovers who ranged the high seas in the first half of the eighteenth century there were sometimes as many as sixty or seventy pirates at a time awaiting trial in newgate about this period in those days there was no efficient ocean police no perpetual patrolling by warships of all nations to prevent and put down piracy as a crime noxious to all later on the ascendancy of the british navy this duty was more or less its peculiar province but till then every sea was infested with pirates sailing under various flags the growth of piracy has been attributed no doubt with reason to the narrow policy of spain with regard to her transatlantic colonies to baffle this colonial system the european powers long tolerated even encouraged these reckless filibusters who did not confine their ravages to the spanish american coast but turned their hands like nautical ishmaels against all the world the mischief thus done was incalculable about seventeen twenty one notorious rover captain roberts took four hundred sail they were as clever in obtaining information as to the movements of rich prizes on the seas as were highwaymen concerning the traffic along the high roads they were particularly cunning in avoiding warships and knew exactly where to run for supplies as captain johnson tells us speaking of the west indies in the opening pages of his history of pirates they have been so formidable and numerous that they have interrupted the trade of europe in those parts and our english merchants in particular have suffered more by their depredations than by the united force of france and spain in the late war pirates were the curse of the north american waters when lord bellamont went as governor of new england in sixteen ninety five and no one was supposed to be more in their secrets at that time or more conversant with their haunts and hiding-place than a certain captain john kidd of new york 
who owned a small vessel and traded with the West Indies. Lord Bellamont's instructions were to put down piracy if he could, and Kidd was recommended to him as a fitting person to employ. For some reason or other, Kidd was denied official status, but it was pointed out to Lord Bellamont that as the affair would not well admit delay, it was worthy of being undertaken by some private persons of rank and distinction and carried into execution at their own expense, notwithstanding public encouragement was denied to it. Eventually the Lord Chancellor, Lord Somers, the Duke of Shrewsbury, the Earl of Romney, the Earl of Oxford, with some others, subscribed a sum of six thousand pounds to fit out an expedition from England, of which Kidd was to have the command and he was granted a commission by letters patent under the great seal to take and seize pirates and bring them to justice. The profits of the adventure, less a fifth, which went to Kidd and another, were to be pocketed by the promoters of the enterprise, and this led subsequently to a charge of complicity with the pirates, which proved very awkward, especially for Lords Orford and Summers. Kidd sailed for New York in the adventure galley, and soon hoisted the black flag. From New York he steered for Madeira, thence to the Cape of Good Hope, and on to Madagascar. He captured all that came in his way. French ships, Portuguese, Moorish, even English ships engaged in legitimate and peaceful trade. He had shifted his flag to one of his prizes, and in her returned to the Spanish main for supplies. Thence he sailed for various ports of the West Indies, and having disposed of much of his booty, steered for Boston. He had been preceded there by a merchant who knew of his piratical proceedings, and gave information to Lord Bellamont. Kidd was accordingly arrested on his arrival in New England. A full report was sent home, and a man of war, the Rochester, dispatched to bring Kidd to England for trial. As the Rochester became disabled, and Kidd's arrival was delayed, very great public clamor arose caused and fed by political prejudices against Lord Bellamont and the other great lords, who were accused of an attempt to shield Kidd. It was moved in the House of Commons that the letters patent granted to the Earl of Bellamont and others respecting the goods taken from pirates were dishonorable to the king, against the law of nations, contrary to the laws and statutes of the realm, an invasion of property, and destructive to commerce. The motion was opposed, but the political opponents of Lord Somers and Lord Orford continued to accuse them of giving countenance to pirates, while Lord Bellamont was deemed no less culpable. The East India Company, which had suffered greatly by Kidd's depredations, and which had been refused letters of mark to suppress piracy in the Indian Ocean, joined in the clamor, and petitioned that Captain Kidd might be brought to speedy trial and that the effects taken unjustly from the subjects of the great mogul may be returned to them as a satisfaction for their losses. It was ruled at last that Kidd should be examined at the bar of the House of Commons, with the idea of fixing part of his guilt on the parties who had been concerned in sending him on his expedition. Kidd was accordingly brought to England and lodged first at the Marshall Sea, the prison of the Admiralty Court, and afterward committed to Newgate. It was rumored that Lord Halifax, who shared the political odium of Lord Somers and Orford, had sent privately for Kidd from Newgate to tamper with him, but the keeper of the jail on being sent for averred that it was false. It is more probable that the other side endeavored to get Kidd to bear witness against Lord Somers and the rest, but at the bar of the house where he made a very contemptible appearance, being in some degree intoxicated, Kidd fully exonerated them. Kidd discovered little or nothing, says Luttrell. In their subsequent impeachment, they were notwithstanding charged with having been Kidd's accomplices, but the accusation broke down. Kidd, in the meantime, had been left to his fate. He was tried with his crew on several indictments for murder and piracy at the Admiralty Sessions of the Old Bailey and hung in 1701. He must have prospered greatly in his short infamous career. According to Luttrell, his effects were valued at 200,000 pounds, and one witness alone, Koji Baba, a Persian merchant, charged him with robbing him in the Persian Gulf of 60,000 pounds. No case was made out against the above-mentioned peers. 
lord orford set up in his defence that in kidd's affair he had acted legally and with a good intention towards the public though to his own loss and lord somers denied that he had ever seen or known anything of kidd hume sums up the matter by declaring that the commons in the whole course of the transaction had certainly acted from motives of faction and revenge other venues are of interest john gow who took the piratical name of captain smith was second mate of the george galley which he conspired with half the crew to seize when on the voyage to santa cruz on a given signal the utterance of a password who fires first an attack was made on the first mate surgeon and supercargo whose throats were cut the captain hearing a noise came on deck when one mutineer cut his throat and a second fired a couple of balls into his body the ship's company consisted of twenty four were now disposed of eight were conspirators and of the remaining eight some of whom had concealed themselves below decks and some in the shrouds four had joined the pirates the other four were closely watched and although allowed to range the ship at pleasure they were often cruelly beaten the ship was rechristened the revenge she mounted several guns and the pirates steered her for the coast of spain where several prizes were taken the first a ship laden with salted cod from newfoundland the second a scotch ship bound to italy with a cargo of pickled herrings the third a french ship laden with oil wine and fruit the pirates also made a descent upon the portuguese coast and laid the people under contributions dissensions now arose in the ship's company gow had a certain amount of sense and courage but his lieutenant was a brutal ruffian often blinded by passion and continually fermenting discord at last he attempted to shoot gow but his pistol missed fire and he was wounded himself by two of the pirates he sprang down to the powder room and threatened to blow up the ship but he was secured and put on board a vessel which had been ransacked and set free the commander of it being desired to hand the pirate over to the first king's ship he met to be dealt with according to his crimes after this the pirates steered north for the orkneys of which gow was a native and after a safe passage anchored in a bay of one of the islands while lying there one of his crew who had been forced into joining them escaped to kirkwall where he gave information to a magistrate and the sheriff issued a precept to the constables and others to seize the revenge soon afterwards ten more of the crew also unwilling members of it laid hands on the long boat and reaching the mainland of scotland coasted along it as far as leith whence they made their way to edinburgh and were imprisoned as pirates gow meanwhile careless of his danger lingered in the orkneys plundering and ransacking the dwelling houses to provide himself with provisions and carrying off plate linen and all valuables on which they could lay hands arriving at an island named calf sound gow planned the robbery of an old schoolmate a mr fee whom he sought to entrap but mr fee turned the tables upon him inviting gow and several of the crew to an entertainment on shore while they were carousing mr fee made his servants seize the pirate's boat and then entering by different doors fell upon the pirates themselves and made all prisoners the rest twenty-eight in number who were still afloat were also captured by various artifices and the whole under orders of the lord chief justice were dispatched to the thames in h m s greyhound for trial at the admiralty court they were committed to the marshal sea thence to newgate and arraigned at the old bailey where gow refused to plead and was sentenced to be pressed to death he pretended that he wished to save an estate for a relation but when all preparations for carrying out the sentence were completed he begged to be allowed to plead and the judge being informed humanely granted his request gow and six others were eventually hanged at execution dock pirates who fell in with ships usually sought to gain recruits among the captured crews the alternative was to walk the plank or to be set adrift in an open boat or landed on an uninhabited island for those who thus agreed under compulsion a still hotter fate was often in store captain massey was in an unfortunate instance of this while serving in the royal african company he was for some time engaged in the construction of a fort upon the coast with a detachment of men 
They ran short of food and suffered frightfully from flux. When at the point of death, a passing ship noticed their signals of distress and sent a boat on shore to bring them on board. The ship proved to be a pirate. Captain Massey did not actually join them, but he remained on board while several prizes were taken. However, he gave information at Jamaica. The pirate captain and others were arrested and hanged, and Captain Massey received the thanks of the governor, who offered him an appointment on the island. But Massey was anxious to return to England, whither he proceeded armed with strong letters of recommendation to the lords of the admiralty. To his intense surprise, instead of being caressed, he was taken into custody, tried, and eventually executed. His case evoked great sympathy. His joining the pirates was evidently an act of necessity, not choice, and he took the earliest opportunity of giving up his involuntary associates to justice, a conduct by which he surely merited the thanks of his country and not the vengeance of the law. From the foregoing account, it is easy to draw conclusions concerning the state of public morals and manners in the 18th century. Both the atrocity of the crimes and the barbarity of the punishments surpass everything the 20th century can show, while to the populace, generally the highwayman and the bully were heroes. Though our century is by no means free from crime, we may congratulate ourselves that we have advanced beyond the 18th, at least so far as crimes of violence are concerned. End of section 16. End of the Chronicles of Newgate, Volume 1 by Arthur Griffiths.